Awesome. So that we're recording. Thank you very much. Uh, it's so great to see everybody back here. Thank you, Jennifer Abrams, for, for spending time with us. Uh, we want to remind everybody that as uh, Jennifer is sharing her thoughts and ideas with us, that you uh, um, are, are free to share those. Uh, make sure, please make sure, though, that you give credit back uh, to Jennifer and all of her stuff. Uh, she has it there on the screen for you. There's her website and her Twitter handle slash probably everything else handle, I'm going to guess at this point. Uh, so if you do, please, you know, um, our people come to us and give away these, these free webinars. We just want to make sure we're respecting the property that they're giving away. Uh, so please make sure that you just give credit back to the author as you, as you go out and, and, and spread their message uh, farther and wider. We just want to remind you all of that. But awesome. So great to have so many of you here. We're 58 and counting fast now. People running in after school. Hopefully you had a great uh, great day of work with your kiddos. Uh, Trisha Freeman is here, part of the Reimagine Washington team. She is here with me. Uh, very excited uh, to have her here, along with Jennifer Abrams. Jennifer, thank you for taking time to be here today. Um, thank you. I am so excited to talk about having hard conversations. As much as we don't like talking about having hard conversations, I know. Uh, it is something that we all have to do. We so. have to. And I'm so appreciative. And just to let you know, thank you for the, for the honor of working with you guys. But also, I'll give you moments during this session that are just like chat box moments. And there are, if there are questions during those times, definitely. And just to clarify, it's till 530, right? Not four to five, they're good. You said the yeah. hour, and then that just oh, sorry. really nervous. No, sorry. This is going to be yeah. like jam-packed thing with like all the different parts. <laughs> You're like getting everything in an hour and a half. And it's like an hour is different. So thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Am I ready to? Am I'm I ready? ready for you. Yeah, we're oh, ready for you. So Let's do this. Could, could Trisha, would you do, would you add it to the chat, the packet? Is yes, I'm about to do that. Yep, yeah. I'm going to put that in the packet for everybody in 30 seconds. Okay, perfect. So the reason that I'm so excited about this is that I leave it on the field and I give it all away and you're getting a 16-page packet with the information because the slides are my livelihood and they're not really going to be as, as I don't know, as helpful as the packet because it's got more. So I definitely want you to download the packet, which is going into the chat, and that is really the key. Now, we have been doing sort of an intro in the, the chat of just sort of me getting a sense of what's your name and what do you do um, and where are you? And just to get a sense of the breadth of who's in this room. Um, and so keep adding that your name, your role, and where you're coming in from, just for me to get a sense. We've got people from Baldwin Park in Southern California. I got like a Southern California contingent here. Um, so yay, hi, Southern California, and hi, Washington, and everybody else. Um, I'm gonna start, um, Trisha just put the ch uh, in the chat the packet that we're gonna be working with, and on page two of that packet is my normal like about the presenter kind of a thing. But the way that I have been introducing myself um, since I worked in New Zealand is with this mihi. When you get an opportunity, blessedly, to work in New Zealand, you are asked to introduce yourself by sharing where your river is, where your mountain is, and who your family is. That's how they want to know you, which is so counter to what happens in the United States, where they want your bio and what books have you read and written and what, where, you know, what is your, you know, your sort of, um, you know, your curricula, you know, you're just like, what is that? And I'm like, oh my gosh, they just want to know like where I ground myself. They want to know where I'm from. And so I'm just going to let you know, my mihi, I, my mountain is down in um, south of um, San Diego in Mexico. It's Mount Kuchma. And I go down there and I hike in Tecate, Mexico. And that's where I really ground myself at least every year. And my river is metaphorically not a river. It's actually a real ocean. And I am a West Coaster. I live on this coast, been here for over 30 years in uh, this region of the United States. And so that's the Pacific Ocean. Um, I have a family. Uh, my mother and my father have passed away, but I have a brother and a sister-in-law and some nephews, and they're in Minnesota. So I have this sort of California base, but I have a Minnesota 
upbringing. And kia ora, Chrissy. Oh, good. So good. So Chrissy's here from, from New Zealand. It's that idea of where do I kind of ground myself. I have a grounding in Minnesota and I have a grounding in, uh, in California. And I always start by introducing and dedicating my work to my nephews. My nephews started virtual school in Minnesota. Uh, the one on the left is Evan. Evan is in third grade now and his older brother, Joe, is on the right. And Joe uh, is in fifth. Now, this gets us into hard conversations. Joe says to me, Aunt Jennifer, you don't work. I said, what do you mean, bud? You don't work. You just fly around and talk to people. That's not working. He looks at work very differently than I think we do. And when I say we, I mean educators. He looks at work very understandably as transactional. Okay. His mother runs a DHL franchise and she goes very early to uh, the Minneapolis St. Paul airport where packages are brought off of big freight planes and put into trucks that her people send out and you get your Amazon package or you get whatever. And it's transactional. You go to work, you do something and you get something. What I think we do is a little different. We are tran we're transformational. And so that's really where this workshop comes from. We're going to talk about conversations, difficult conversations, but I want to start with just conversations in general, because it's valuable to actually think about the work that we do in this way. So we're going to start with this quote. This quote won't be in the packet. It is on my website. Uh, it's in the book, um, but it's from a woman named Harriet Lerner. Dr. Harriet Lerner says, our conversations invent us. And through our speech and our silence, we become smaller or larger selves. And through our speech and our silence, we enhance or di we diminish or enhance the other person and we narrow or expand the possibilities between us. How we use our voice determines the quality of our relationships, who we are in the world and what that world can be and might become clearly a lot is at stake here. So her name is Dr. Harriet Lerner. Uh, she wrote a book called The Dance of Connection. She's written a lot of books, uh, Dance of Anger. She talks about fear. She talks about apologies. She's extraordinary. Um, but I think our conversations can invent us and we become smaller or larger selves as a result of them. And there's a lot at stake in how we speak. And speech is transformative. And that's really what we want to talk about today, especially with difficult conversations. So I am from Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we are Minnesota nice. I don't know if you know much about the middle of the US in that way, but we put our head down and you know plow through the snow uphill both ways, you know, uh, and there's snow for six months and nobody has a hard conversation. We are, we're just not primed for it. So I ended up going to school out east, uh, which sort of toughened me up a little bit. And then I went to school out west and I started teaching. And teachers and hard conversations, hmm, not so much really, um, didn't know a lot. And then I became a new teacher coach and I became a professional developer. And I went to my district office and I started working as a, a, a leader in a new way and I was very impressed with myself, which was wrong, okay? There was not enough humility in this. And this is what happened. Terry Pierce says, there are many people who think they wanna be matadors, only to find themselves in the ring with 2,000 pounds of bull bearing down on them. And then they discover what they really wanted was to wear tight pants and hear the crowd roar. I am not equating our colleagues to bull, but it was this moment where I thought I would be in a position where people would listen to me, that I would not be refused, people wouldn't question, I would just share my, so my quote unquote expertise and it would be great. And what I realized at that moment was that I had a credential in how to teach students the subject of English. And I didn't have a credential on how to talk effectively to adults. And I really woke up to the fact that there's 
a bit of a difference. I had to study cognitive coaching. I studied how to facilitate. I studied how to lead professional learning for adults. And I had to figure out how to have a hard conversation. And I wasn't finding many people in my area at the time as models. And I don't know about you, but do you, when you look at the books in education, in the educational field, are there books about having hard conversations? They're usually outside our field. Um, they're in corporate or they're in, they're about how to deal with a difficult employee or a difficult parent. The person is always difficult. And I'm like, well, what if it's not that they're always difficult? You know, what if I just want to find my voice around what matters? So I ended up watching conversations and I found two unhelpful ways that people were having conversations. There is no doubt in my mind that this is happening in your school or in your district, the ready aim approach. Wow, that was not okay. That was totally inappropriate. I really should say something, but I'm gonna hesitate. I'm gonna go out into the parking lot and I'm gonna talk about the person. I'm going to go home to my spouse or partner and complain about the person to the point that by next month, your person that's really irritating you will be known by their first name by your spouse or partner, okay? Not useful, not necessarily, not ne useful necessarily, and you're gonna lose sleep. And I've got people who say they have Maalox on their bedside table. They're so anxious about these kinds of conversations. So I'm like, not helpful, not a helpful way, nor is this. This is the ready fire approach. Now, few people are gonna sign up for this workshop and watch this webinar and engage that are like, what are you talking about? I don't have any hard conversations, I speak. I speak, I say what I want, there's not a, there's not a hard conversation in my inbox. I, if I'm metacognitive, maybe I speak a little too fast, I kind of jump the gun, maybe I say a little too much. A little too much are people that want to bring all that evidence in and they go, you know, you've been like this since 2015. And then people are like, how long have you felt this way? And that's absurd. So I think to myself, there's got to be a middle ground. And that's what I'm going to give you. And you have in the packet that Trisha put in the chat box. You've got some ideas there. Okay. Now, uh, there is no, we can't do it today, right? Because it's only a, a 90 minute thing. We can't see you. There will be no role playing. There's never any role playing in my workshops, especially about this, because there's plenty of anxiety when you're not having somebody come back as the passive aggressive colleague or the mean boss or whatever. But I do want us to think to ourselves, what, what's going to be relevant today? What's going to be important? What's, what's up for me in terms of hard conversations? Is there an interpersonal hard conversation that you're thinking, this would be really helpful for me to, to put on the top of mind that the way somebody has been speaking or emailing or comments that they've made have been hurtful. It's not been professional, collaborative, useful, and it's getting in the way of you being uh, a productive and effective team or colleague. So interpersonal is valid, as is any kind of conversation that you want to have that you find difficult. And maybe it's about performance. It's a feedback conversation about uh, stepping up to the benchmarks or meeting the needs or following the initiative because you have a team and you had agreements and we, we need to do that. You do not have to be the supervisor to have this conversation. Let me repeat that. You do not need to be somebody's supervisor to have a feedback conversation. An evaluative conversation is different. And if I was talking to people in unions in Ontario, Canada, there might be things within the union agreements of colleague to colleague, but we're not there right now. Okay. I think we need to step up and have conversations with our colleagues. Or you might say, I'm good with my team. I'm not good as a principal with the whole faculty. Is this going to be okay for the whole faculty? And the answer is some of it will be. 
So it could be a team, a group, not just a one-on-one, -on -one. could be the whole third grade, could be the whole PE department, could be that you need to talk to a parent or a student or an admin. Oh, my goodness, a hard conversation up. Yes, you can have a hard conversation up. There's some ways to do it successfully. Or a teaching assistant or an instructional aide or somebody that's helping you in your classroom. All of those are places where things might kind of get uh, a, a rub might happen and you might need to speak up. The goal of this particular workshop is not to make the hard conversation move so comfortably and easily though. That would be unreasonable and actually not true. And I did not write a book called Hard Conversations Made Easy. My friend Alan wanted me to write that book. He said it would sell more. And I said, but it wouldn't be true. I actually don't think they're easy. The question is, are they necessary? And late Congressman uh, here in the US, um, John Lewis, if you haven't seen Good Trouble on, you know, on Amazon or Netflix or whatever, watch it. I mean, it's the idea that we have to get into trouble, necessary trouble. And I think hard conversations, if you really feel that they're necessary, they'll be troubling but they're necessary. So you'll be able to really work on the, the adjective of that and not the noun. It's about really saying, you know what? Might feel uncomfortable, but it's still the right thing for me to do. And just because of blessed memory, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, speak, even, speak your mind even if your voice shakes, okay? So we gotta speak up and get into necessary trouble. So if we're going to honor those two amazing uh, statesmen and women, we got to do it. Now, you might say, oh, no, I don't want to do it. You know who really should do it? The principal or the person who has the office or the person who has uh, the business card, the one who makes more money. Because I usually do, I, I talk to people, a whole school, okay? will come and it will be the custodian and the assistant and the, the secretary. I got the whole group in a room and they pull me over and they're like, you know who really needs to do this is the principal. It's really not our job. And this is, this is the good or bad news here. I'll look at whoever that is and I'll say, are you over the age of 18? Yeah. Are you modeling for the students in this school what it means to be a civil and mature adult? Yeah. And they start just sort of, you know, imploding, you know, and I say, well, at that point, it's a collective responsibility. I don't, I don't disagree that the principal should be having hard conversations. I don't even suggest that you have the ones that that person should be having. It's when it's your conversation to have, because you're there to also build a culture of excellence, because you're there to create a sense of urgency around the work. Why not know how to do it? I just don't think one person in an organization can be the only one who knows how to do this. I just don't think that's the right thing. And so I look at it and say, would this help? Would it help to know that we're going to learn about having hard conversations where, and I apologize about those bullets, that's not what I meant, um, where the conversation assists you in finding your voice in order for the other person to become more aware and more empathic, to not just know what their contribution is to a given problem, but how it can be remedied or fixed or changed. That person can be part of the solution. This isn't all capital letters. This is not screaming. This is not yelling. This is not exclamation points. It's not about any of that. It's about how to have a humane, growth-producing conversation. So wouldn't it be great if I ask this, okay? I ask this of people when they wanna give me a little feedback at the end of a workshop or I've worked for a given district or whatever, and they're like, can I give you a, 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 you know, a little input? I go, absolutely. And I try to put my hands down and not and not kind of um, protect myself non-verbally. 
put my hands down, but I say it really helps. I want the feedback and it helps if it comes in a humane and growth producing way. And people go, oh, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. Because they weren't thinking about how to say it so I could hear it or if it would be helpful, if anything would change. And I think that's the intent, okay, of what we're trying to do here. Now, a few more slides and I'm gonna ask you to jump into the chat, okay? And thank you, Brianne, for doing whatever you just did in the, in the chat. Um, I think that if you don't have to have a hard conversation, don't have a hard conversation. I do not have hard conversations 24 seven. I honest to God don't, okay? I think that you should be a coach and a colleague. You should ask questions. You should suspend your certainty and get curious about what's going on. I think you don't have a hard conversation. But when do you? It doesn't always fit to coach. And so I have in my mind a starting set of questions. Like, does, it, does this warrant a hard conversation? Does it meet the following criteria? So for me, I, I was a new teacher coach for 16 years. I mean, I worked in the school district for 26 years, right? And then I went as a consultant and I would watch and I would see, I would facilitate meetings and do professional learning and coach. And I would think to myself, is this educationally or professionally unsound for students or staff? Two plus two is not 10. This is the second time this norm has been violated. You know, I mean, do I need to say something? And remember, this isn't about yelling, okay? I actually think a hard conversation is just not a question. I actually think it's a statement with, um, with uh, a period. Kids spending six hours on Zoom, for example, with a, with, you know, as a, with a teacher maybe, not okay. Um, do I think, that this, inner, this thing that I'm watching right now is physically unsafe. I might speak up sooner than later if it was physically unsafe, wouldn't you? I've had people come to this workshop though and say, it all worked out, I just need to preempt with that, but what should I have said about that it wasn't cool to bring the Python into the pre-K without a cage? And I said, how about no? Like to me, that seems like the easiest hard conversation, okay? Um, and she was torn because it was an engaging experience for the three-year-old. And I said, it could have asphyxiated a three-year-old and it probably wasn't physically safe. There's a way to speak up in those moments. I've seen, well, anyway, we'll all go have a drink and we'll talk about all the physically unsafe things we've seen. You gotta say something at that point. This is the tricky part, emotionally damaging to anybody. Because you might think, oh, was that, uh, am I being too sensitive? Uh, is that really just my perspective? It's a question that I want you to really ask yourself because if any of those things happen, do you have the tools in your toolkit? And that's what I wrote for myself because I didn't have them. This is a workbook that I wrote for me. I literally didn't know where to look. And nothing in our field at that point had been written. And so I wrote it. And then in 2016, I wrote the second book. It's not the newer version of the first book. It's the addition. It's like people go, you didn't address this, and you didn't address this, and you didn't address this. I can't do it all in 90 minutes, but there's more, OK? And if you're thinking about it, there you go, right? So just a chat box, three minutes, two minutes. Any questions that maybe uh, Jeff and Trisha are seeing in the thing? Are there insights, questions, moments of ahas, thoughts? What are you thinking? And I'll just take two minutes and I'm going to put on my own little timer. And then we're going to go in. But Trisha, Jeff, anything? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also just leaving some space for people to go and fill okay. in the, the chat. But I'm thinking too, Jennifer, about everything that you just said and the way that you have described your role. You often write about yourself as a voice coach. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of think that's almost um, a snapshot of what you've just taken us 
through in the first three 30 minutes. And I'm wondering if you would just sort of um, expand on that a little bit, how that idea came to mind that, you know, that was sort of the way that you wanted to see yeah. your role was as a voice coach. Yeah. I, a coach is there to support you in moving your development forward. So it was coming from a very different space. It wasn't, oh, mentor, tell me what to say. Um, you know, and well, I'll, when I was young, you know, that, that's not where I was going. I was just saying, here are some, as a coach, I think you're finding your teacher voice as a new teacher. You're finding your facilitator voice. You're finding your coaching voice. You're finding your, it's about finding a voice and that, that fits for that particular moment. And we have different, I don't know, syntax, different uh, energies, different anything. And so how might one find their voice in, a, in this kind of a conversation? I'm writing, uh, I'm writing this new book that I'm writing, which we're not talking about today. And I was told that I have a lot of passive construction in it. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, it's like, it's like you're unsure. I said, I am unsure. That's where the draft is. Well, you can't be unsure. I said, well, I have to psychologically be in the space to be sure. You know what I mean? And then my voice changes. And so that was what um, my editor is a coach for me right now. She's trying to like move my brain and my psyche and my language so that it all is aligned. And, and I need a coach. I don't need somebody to tell me how to do it because that, that really riles me. But offer me opportunities, suggestions, ideas, that's cool. So that's why I'm a coach. Because I, I, I think a coach is just somebody to play with it with you and with your voices. You know, and Jennifer, you know, I think it's, you know, talking about us finding our voice, there's sort of a little bit of a theme popping up here in the chat about also folks needing to perhaps find their ears. So we've had a few people say, you know, I've, I've worked yeah. up the nerve, I've engaged in the difficult conversation, but then perhaps the other person has then become defensive. So yeah. a few questions around, okay, yeah. now what? And, and I, I will tell you with the now what piece, and I don't mean to be disappointing, but the now what piece is after the 90 minutes. And I'll tell you why. And first off, the now what, what if they get defensive? Great, buy this book. There's, there's like a whole chapter on what if they say this to you? What if they say that to you? That isn't where our emphasis and our focus is today. Our focus is on staying on our side of the net. Uh, I learned that metaphor from an interpersonal dynamics class at Stanford, a guy named David Bradford, Stanford Business School. I didn't go to B school at Stanford, but I participated in stuff. And it's like, stay on your side of the net. Try to be as humane and as growth producing on your side so that if the person gets defensive, it isn't because you weren't as clear as you needed to be and as, as you know what I mean? And so just, just keep, stay in your lane, keep your blinders on just for this 90 minutes, right? But I so know, I so know that that's exactly where you're, where you're going to go. And I, and I have something, it's just not today. So I want us to have us think about a case study in our mind, okay? I want to go over why we hesitate really fast to honor that, but to change your frame around it. In the packet, you've got questions to ask yourself before you speak up. We're going to talk about how do we say things professionally? How do we plan for the conversation? And I'll get you, and you have it in the packet, a scripting scaffold, okay? Um, and then I'll finish up with some what's or where's or when, some body language stuff, some stuff to do. So that's literally, you've got something in your packet, but that's, that's it. And thank you, Trisha's written, um, here's the packet again. So if you came in late in the chat, it's now, it's right there at the, at the, at the bottom. Now, to me, it's not the same thing to talk of bulls as to be in the bull ring. And during my day long and two day long and all that kind of those workshops, we really like need the dough on this. We really talk about specific hard conversations that you're facing and it's not theoretical. I'm not trying to increase your level of, of hysterical. I'm just saying, let's make it relevant. So keep thinking, is there a hard conversation that you want to have and what are the circumstances and and what's bothering you and then we're going to go into this thing what's what are some of the reasons you haven't said anything yet because i want to honor those those reasons and you'll notice that i didn't say what are some of your excuses okay that's not what i mean 
I'm really saying that it's a reasonable thing to hesitate and an understandable thing to hesitate. And so you should feel okay that you hesitated. Okay. I give you, I give you permission to hesitate and I'm going to reframe those hesitations as competing commitments. Robert Keegan and Lisa Lasko Leahy are two Harvard, um, psychologist. Uh, he was a professor. She, I think, still works there in the School of Ed. And they wrote this book, How the Way We Talk Can Change the Way We Work. And the first half of this book is about how you talk to yourself, not even about anybody else. How do you talk to yourself? And you know that all of those hesitations are you talking to yourself? No, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. And you don't do it. You don't have the hard conversation. And then things do change in work because you didn't. Okay, they would call them competing commitments. These hesitations on page three in your packet, the tensions, the, the competing commitments that I really know from people, and they're in chapter two of the book, to be reasonable and normal are internal commitments because you really are committed, for example, to being liked. And that's not wrong. You want to be liked. You have an internal commitment to being the good person, to being the, I was the, you know, I was the third child and I was always the go along, get along. And I like being the one that everybody thinks is so easygoing. And I can't have a hard conversation because I would, it would compete with that internal me. Okay. It's competing. It doesn't always have to win this, this need in here. So I want you to look at it with less rigidity. It's not in concrete. These are normal competing commitments and they don't have to win. Safety. So there are some people that will say to me, I have a mortgage and I have two kids. And if I speak up, I will be known as the upstart and I won't keep my job. And my financial safety is more important. Or, Ready? They're retiring soon anyway. So why bother this year? Why speak up? I mean, I know it's not really good for the team for the next nine months and all of our Zoom calls are really going to be a pain, but she's going to be gone in 2021. So it's about your personal comfort over having the hard conversation. Just, I'm just, I'm not judging it. I'm, I'm showing it to you sort of like in a mirror. Maybe you're going to tell me it's no sense of urgency. It hasn't happened more than two or three times. Therefore, we haven't hit the threshold. And then maybe if we do, we'll, we'll do it. But that's your reasoning as of right now. Maybe you want to get an A. I know people who say, I want to get an A in having this hard conversation. And until I know absolutely surely that everything's going to get beautiful, be beautiful and I can wrap it up with a bow, I'm not having this conversation. That's a, that's a tricky one. Okay, there are two people in this conversation, right? Uh, maybe you're going to tell me distrusting yourself. I'm new to my job. I'm new to the field. I'm new to this school. I'm just new to this, this role. I don't know how things go. Or you don't know if the other person's going to be able to handle it. And I'm going to tell a story for one minute about that. And I call it the cat just died. So I say to Trisha, Trisha, we have to talk to Jeff. He's not meeting his, he agreed to, and he's not meeting those expectations. And we really do need to talk to him because as a team, it's not, we're not being able to move forward. And Trisha says, you can't, Jeff's cat died this week. And he's really not able to hear you. And I say, well, I don't want to be a mean person. I don't have a cat, but I don't want to be a mean person. So we'll, we'll, we'll allow for some personal care right now. And we will let go of the professional accountability right now. We'll just focus. And then I'll say, is next week better? And Trish goes, you won't believe this. He got into a car crash. Oh my gosh. Now we really have to focus on Jeff. We can't focus on him as a professional. We have to focus on, on him as a person. But then the next week his mother breaks a hip. And the next week his kid gets the flu. And there's a lot of cats dying. Okay. The question is, can we have personal care and professional accountability, or are they mutually exclusive? And I actually don't think they are. I think you can hold care and hold professional accountability. Maybe you're going to tell me, Jennifer, you don't understand things here in Washington. In small towns, 
we have the roles are too enmeshed. We go to church with these people. We, uh, our kids play on the same baseball team. If I'm working internationally and I'm working in a place where very few people in that particular area speak English, it's like, this is my, this is my, this is my peeps, right? I can't, I go on vacation with these people. Can you, can you be, can you like decouple that? It's an interesting challenge. Maybe you're going to say, I have a lot of hard conversations in my personal life right now. I do not have what it takes. Maybe you're going to tell me, nobody listens to me. I'm a, I'm a young woman. Nobody listens to me. I'm an old fart. Nobody listens to me. I'm African-American. Nobody listens to me um, about what I want to talk about as a person who identifies as white. Identity can be a tension. I'm not saying tensions are wrong. Perhaps another person would be the right person to have a better outcome. It's a good question. Fatigue, I'm gonna hit them or cry. Or these last two, personality or intent. We don't have hard conversations with people who have a good personality um, because they just take one for the team and they're so wonderful most of the time. And so we don't wanna pick on anything. But then we also don't have a hard conversation with people because they have a bad personality. And in the chat, people talk about, what about people who are mean? What about people who are so defensive? I, I wonder if we let them off the hook because we might say, they don't mean it. They don't intend to be that way. They're just going through a rough time or intention, you know, might be, you know, what can I do? You know, I'm from, I had one person who said, what can I do? I'm from New York. I had a person who literally said that. He was being a complete jerk, doing a bunch of stuff in a meeting that was inappropriate, and he wanted to be excused. His behavior wanted to be excused because that's how he was raised. I'm not interested in intent as I am in impact. I'm not as interested in personality as I am in actions and behaviors. And my guess is for most of us in public schools, we've got, and I bet in most private independent schools as well, we've got professionalism standards. And it isn't about personality, it's about professional behavior. So what wins out when we don't speak up is on page four. And there's just some cool quotes there about pain and guilt and not living by your principles and that there's a negative impact. But I wanted just to mention all of that and just say, do you see yourself? Because it's perfectly okay. And we're moving forward, whether you have those tensions or not. So which ones apply to you in your case study? Place them in the chat box and watch this. It's okay if you say all of the above. Because it's okay. I, I have all of those. So just take a minute and start typing in, does some of those tensions relate to you more? Which ones apply to you? And yes, you're right, Sarita, you can excuse bad behavior. Oh, so we do though so much. Mm, nice. Oh, thank you, perfect, yep. I think that I don't know it, what Sean's role is, um, but Sean is saying he wants to be, I think it's a, a male, wants to be pleasing. I think that in education, we wanna be pleasing. We wanna be viewed as nurturing. We want to be seen as uh, supportive individuals. We didn't become an attorney. Uh, we didn't want conflict, you know, in our life. Um, and we still need to get into necessary trouble. Yeah, distrust of yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, you'll notice, and I don't have a clue. I mean, I, I read about who people were when this chat started. But this is, this is normal. This is a chat box that could happen all over the world, right? Um, as a queer educator, worry about the people perceive you as difficult, yeah. It's, is this your, are you a difficult person? Are you too much? Um, you're always pushing, right? Ruth Bader Ginsburg was quite a steely woman, right? You can do it. Step up. Yeah, yep, they'll complain. Yeah, because then, right, Consuelo is saying some good stuff. I, it's, um, my next book is about growing up in the workplace. 
And it's about how do we as adults need to bring ourselves to, to all of the work that we do. And I know that lots of people want to play victim and it's really, really, yeah, it's frustrating. All right. I really might, I appreciate it. Yep. Um, yes, yes. And if administrators are okay, because what if they go to the administrator, they go to mommy or daddy and that, that person is saying, well, you know, we had agreements <laughs> there. It's, it's really interesting, right? All oh, thank you guys. I, um, I know that all of that's there and I want you to, to frame that as a competing commitment, externalize it. Don't embed it in your psyche. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm working with uh, students in Hong Kong about engaging in difficult conversations. So possible, very possible to talk about. I want to um, externalize these. Oh, there's Jennifer's competing commitments. Oh, there, there they are again. That, that voice has come in. You, if you can externalize it and say, you, you don't always need to run everything. Distrust. You don't always have to run everything. Perfectionism. Maybe we can see it for attention and then feel that fear and do it anyway. And so Eleanor Roosevelt is coming to mind at this point. You can do the thing you think you can't. If you have enough, uh, if you can go cognitive, I think a lot of the time we go, um, we stay in the emotion. It, it starts to suck us in. It sweeps us. And if we can go cognitive, I think it would be a better idea. Okay. So are there ways that we can be more strategic and be conscientious and think before we speak and get ourselves into a space of thinking and out of uh, an overly emotional response? And I call this, um, for me, because I'm a ready fire person, managing my impulsivity or not going to the ceiling. If I feel like something's really wrong, I have an immediate impulse to speak up. Some of these questions will ask me to kind of think about that for a minute. I also call it, this is the section of not allowing the alien in your stomach to pop out. For some of us, we remember Sigourney Weaver in the movie Alien um, from I think the late 70s, where she had an alien in her stomach in the sci-fi and this ugly, ugly alien came out of the stomach it was so ugly. That is me when I think kids are not being served. <sighs> not cool. So you have to figure out how to say something in a humane way. So there are questions that I have I've, I've offered you. They're on pages five to eight. There's like 72 questions there. And they're questions that people can ask themselves before they have a hard conversation. They are in categories. These are the seven categories. So on pages five to eight, and if you are still wondering where, what, what five to eight, Tricia has put uh, a Google doc in, um, a doc into the chat box. So on pages five to eight, there are 70 plus questions in categories that I think people need to consider before they speak up. I don't know you. I don't know you from the chat. I don't know who you are. So I don't know if I need to only point you to the timing or the consequences or the doability or whatever. So I need you to skim them all. Doesn't mean that I need you to answer every single one before you have a hard conversation. It's not my intent, okay? I just have to put them all out there because I don't know who's reading. And you're going to put them through your filter of metacognition and say, with regards to yourself or your case study, what are the top five questions you need to consider? And if you could, without annotation or explanation, there's really no need for that because that would take way too long. Take three or four minutes and just, I'm going to time it for three and skim pages five to eight. And just so that I know, I just so that I know you're there, um, please write down one or two of the questions in the chat. Because just things that resonated with you. And it'd be interesting just to see how varied they are. And if, if somebody has already done it, you can put the same question again, too. It's all good. And these came from a bunch of different people. I just didn't make them up out of my head. 
These are your colleagues who taught you this stuff. Mm hmm Good question, Tricia. <laughs> it's so it's so interesting because Shannon's writing, do I have to say anything or will it fix itself? And and you know, you're saying, what would happen to the students if I didn't speak? There's one that's an urgency and one's like, please, no urgency. It's very funny. Yeah, yeah. Some of it is more about the emotion. Some of it's about being other focused. Very cool. Yeah, yep. I promise that we'll talk about emotions at the end. You'll laugh. It'll be the last thing that we do. Yep. See how some of these are really cognitive and some of these are really emotional? I mean, I think it really depends, right? Good question, Marcia. Do I model what I'm looking for? Because they'll let you know. If you're not walking your talk, hypocrisy right now is very much on my mind in the political sphere. Don't walk your talk, I walk your talk. Yep. Yeah. Daria, yeah. It's a really sweet question to ask. Why does a reasonable, rational, decent person do this? You know, what, what, would, their, what would their rationale be? Why is that happening? It's a great question. Okay, just another 45 seconds or so. Yeah. There's a lot about silence. What if I don't say something? What if I, am I, am I condoning by not, by not speaking up? There's a lot of people with deep principle in this group that are torn by not saying things. I, I, I respect that. I respect that you're torn. I understand the tearing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. Very cool. Deep, you're deep people. Um, so, it's a good question, Diane. And, and is there a, a benchmark, a, an agreement, a norm, <laughs> you know? And it's not just your judgment, but is it, is it about what, how we've agreed to, what's our social contract with each other? What have we agreed to do? Yes, interesting. Does decisiveness come off as a dictatorship? We need to have a talk to pal. Um, there's a lot of really interesting questions there. And that's the food for thought. So we've got to, I would rather have us, and we don't have time, but I would rather have you sitting in the contemplation of these questions and not being swept by the competing commitments, because this is a, a worthy endeavor, I think, to contemplate and to reflect, um, and then to make some decisions based on this. And note, note that these are questions to consider before you have a hard conversation. Do you have to consider them all? Nope. And do you need to have a hard conversation now that you've been doing this? Nope. It's just the idea that you were thinking before you speak. And two things, that I didn't see in the chat, but that I do know move this workshop forward and will make a better and a more humane growth producing conversation is do you know, before you even think about having a start conversation, what the real problem is and are you able to state it in a professional way? Because you know that you have had people come at, at you, uh, to you, but at you. This isn't working. You know, my kid's not feeling safe. It's, it's, it's um, a little emotional and it's not clear enough. Okay. So that's the first question that I want to get into. And then the second question is, do you have an action plan thought out with which to move forward? If the person said to you, well, what do you want me to do about it? 
whether you're their colleague or not, whether you're of equal status or whatever, what do you want me to do about it? I, it's better if you have an answer. You may not ever be asked that question, but I want you to know an answer to that because I think it's more future focused. So that's where we're headed. But for fun, I thought what I'd start with is the good news that you might not even need to have a hard conversation. How's that? You can't leave the webinar yet, but how about maybe you need to have a clarifying conversation? Do you know that you and this person have had a clarifying conversation about this before? Do you know that what you are expecting or what you're about to speak about is, is something that isn't coming out of left field, okay? And that I think is huge. Clarifying conversations, essential. This is a quote that's in chapter, I think, four of my of my book i'm trying to remember almost all conflict is a result of violated expectations my question to you is do both parties in this have the same expectations my guess is that somebody violated an expectation but was it just in your head and I talk about an ex-boyfriend named Sean all the time because I, it's happened to me. I'm owning that I have not had clarifying conversations. I was angry at an ex-boyfriend because he was not connecting with me. And I was really frustrated because he wasn't being a good boyfriend and he wasn't connecting with me. Now, do you think I had ever sat down with him to talk about how I wanted to be connected with? No, he should just have read my mind. He should have known that he should send me flowers the first Monday of every month, and he should talk to me three times a day. And isn't that something that he should just know? We know that we're never clear like that a lot of the time in our personal relationships. I just want to know, are you sure in your professional relationships that you have been clear? Now, to me, clarity has to come before accountability, period. I just think everybody has to be on the same page. So I think to myself, are we working with people who haven't looked at their job description in 23 years? Has the job description changed? Um, do we have different norms? Do we have different agreements? Have things shifted? Were we ever clear to begin with? And if we haven't, we gotta have a clarifying instead of a hard conversation. Now, let's say we're talking to a colleague and they're a teacher and we're a teacher. I think classroom management or having a safe and a, clim a climate of belonging. That's pretty clear. That's probably in your state standards. It's in our state standards. It's, it's something that we have agreed to is something that's part of what we do. And there is PBIS and there's discipline with dignity and there's, I don't know, um, morning meeting. And you're all saying, what are you talking about? What, you're what I'm talking about is the, all the different classroom management practices and programs. So are we sure just that we don't have just classroom management, but we have an understanding of what we're doing at this school? Same thing with what we're doing with English as an additional language or EL learners or working with special needs or learning support. Are there norms, expectations? Does everybody know that? Are we working on planning and instruction and assessment in a specific way? I think it's a valid conversation to have. I just don't know how specific you've been. And is everybody a professional? That's the tricky part, okay? In the book on the right of the slide, I have a resource that asks specific questions about all of this. But where's your hard conversation localized if it's with a teacher? If it's about professionalism, the reason that I am so into this uh, is not just the next book, but a book I also wrote because I was a new teacher coach for 16 years and I wrote a book called The Multi-Generational Workplace. And I wrote it after I realized, again, I mean, poor Sean, the ex-boyfriend, and poor my new teachers for a while because what I was telling them to begin with was welcome to Palo Alto Unified. If you're respectful, you're courteous, you're sensitive and timely, you'll do just fine here. And then I would not. And then 
my respectful wasn't their respectful. My courteous wasn't their courteous. My timely wasn't their timely. And I realized we needed to be more explicit. So if you've got rubs, things that are not really, that are bugging you, I think you need more explicitness to start at least about email. Timely. I don't know what timely is. And certain districts have said, you've got to get back to parents within 24 hours. Okay. Better than get back in a timely way. Okay. Because I timely is different. How do we work with our colleagues and at staff meetings? How do we, um, what can we expect of somebody when we come together? Um, working with office staff, does everybody know what the school secretary does and doesn't do? Um, we had some problems with dress code. I'm talking about the adults, okay? In the time of Zoom now, um, there's been some real interesting conversation about adults and what they should wear on, on, on a Zoom call. A shirt, maybe, you know, not your swim trunks, you know. But people are, instead of being disgusted or shocked, be clear. That's all I'm saying. And how do we handle conflict? So for me, I look at it and say, how can I frame my conversation professionally? And if you're not going to have a hard conversation with a teacher, do you have language that's neutral for anybody else? Uh, does it fall into a, a leadership framework? Is there language that's more neutral? And the same thing with principals. I'm going to move through this. And the same thing with administrative assistants or instructional aides or business office. I just know that most job descriptions are not as clear as they need to be. Uh, I had a lot of other duties as a sign. I'm sure you have too. And then you're angry that those duties were not met and you are, are those duties that were unassigned, but they were other duties that you were supposed to do. We never knew exactly what the degree that we had to get to or the, we just, I don't know. So for me, I really want you to stay professional. And if you need to have a clarifying conversation, fantastic. Go do that. But if you're going to have a hard conversation, promise me that when you look at the resources and you look at whatever has been um, spoken, that that's what you can then hold people to account to, um, ask people to be responsible for, okay? But if they didn't know, it's not fair to have a hard conversation, okay? Now, once we know that, we've decided, yep, it's on the plate. Yep, we, uh, we've said it before. Yep, they saw it in an email. They heard it in a staff meeting. You know, they, they signed off on it. You can have a hard conversation, okay? Or I coached to it a couple times. They know about it. I coached to it, and now it's really not okay. Now you've got to have a hard conversation. I suggest that you imagine that the person at the end of you saying what you're going to say goes, well, what do you want me to do about that? And that's why we plan, okay? That's why we plan. So on page nine, we have a one-pager. It's a chapter in the book uh, of an outcome map. And this outcome map is a map that my colleagues, Bob uh, Garmston and Bruce Wellman used in a book called The Adaptive School, which is a fantastic book. And they are two of my favorite uh, colleagues. And the map in their book was not for a hard conversation. It was just a planning map. And I asked for permission to add it to my book to plan for a hard conversation. But you could use this map for any kind of plan, okay? It's a thinking map. The first thing that I want you to know about this map on page nine is that you do not fill this map out and then hand it to the other person. Oh, here's your problem and hand it. I am going to be, I'm having a clarifying conversation with you right now. You will not fill this out and then hand it to the other person. You don't do that. This is your thinking map. Okay, and it has six questions. And the six questions are to be thought about before you have this conversation. The first one is, do you know what you want to talk about and what the problem is? And can you name it professionally? You want to know what the problem is and you want it to be stated neutrally enough so the person doesn't grimace or have saliva. Can you hear my saliva? You see my face? You don't want the person to already be so upset 
the minute that something comes out of your mouth because it's caused saliva. I call that a saliva moment. You are a drama queen. You are a pain in the butt to work with. Saliva moment. And it's not um, political, politically good. It's not professional and it's not actually in standards. You know, don't be a pain in the butt is not in their job description. Okay. What, what is? That's a really good question. What's the problem? Know that before you have the conversation. Do not come in and go, I, this is just not working. Which is what people do. I don't know what it is, but I just, I can't be here. Well, that's really not helpful, right? So I need to get a little clearer before I speak up. And I want to think about it also in the future. And I want to know what's a better outcome than what's happening now. So the problem is we're not as collaborative as we would. I, I, I don't feel like this collaborative relationship is as effective as it, as it could be. And I'd love for us to work effectively together. That's, it's moving us from a problem to a, a possible outcome of a future, a, a desired state. It's much more uh, future focused. And the reason that I want us to move there is because I just don't want you to get stuck in the blaming and irritation. And I want us to think ahead to what we want instead of what we got, okay? Now, the thing that we don't do enough of is we don't get to, well, what do you want me to do about it? We do this with students. We don't do it with other adults. And I understand why. But what would it look like and sound like if the person was more successful in whatever you want them to be doing. As a new teacher coach, and I love administrators, I've dated administrators, administrators are my friends. I just have this feeling that people, let me go backwards, administrators go from problem to outcome and never move past it. And as a new teacher coach, I watched people go, um, I just sense there's not enough engagement in your class and um, just need more, okay? And then the new teacher had no idea what to do. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was maybe humane. I mean, at least engagement was in the standards, but it wasn't growth producing. Not helpful, okay? Um, you, um, I had one person who said, I just sense you just don't have enough presence in the classroom, you know, like presence. Uh, you just need to have more of that. How can anybody do anything with that? It's not growth producing. So for me, I really want you to think to yourself, what would it look like and sound like in your mind if the person was more successful, better, the relationship was good, the, the, the teacher was differentiating, you were co-teaching more effectively. I don't know what it is, but think to yourself, what are some things if the person said to you, well, what do you want me to do about it? You'd be able to tell them. Now, I have one person ready for the saliva. Do you want me to tell another adult exactly what to do? We hired them. They're an adult, they're older than me. They've been here longer than me. I do not need to spoon feed them. And this was ready for the saliva. Do you want me to bring my own spoon so that I can spoon feed them? I was like, saliva, that's not the intention of this. We're trying to be humane and we're trying to be growth producing. So they're not doing it. Be supportive, plan. Why might they not be doing it is the next question. But what are they, what do you want them to do? Now, I want us to get, and this would be the two-day workshop, I want us to think internally, why might that person not be doing it right now? What internally in them can't they resource, can't they access? And I don't want you to ask the question like, why aren't they doing it with an attitude? It's compassionate curiosity. Why is this person not doing it right now? And that's gonna lead us to page 10. And on page 10 is a set of questions for you. And this is why I really love to really go deep into this workshop. It's a deep dive into being more allocentric. Allocentric is being other focused, okay? 
Um, what is going on with them? Other focused. Is it a cognitive shift they're going to need to make? Is it going to be an emotional challenge for them? Is it going to take? And most of the time, if you've read any of Dan and what a Dan Heath and his brother, I can't remember the guy's name, the Heath brothers, it's skill and will. Okay. Um, but it, what is it? Is it going to be cognitive? Is it going to be emotional or both? Maybe they don't have the, they never got the memo. They didn't, they don't have the information. Maybe they didn't attend the training and they don't have the skills. Maybe they don't believe this is a part of what should be going on. At which point there's maybe some conversation about philosophy and some differences and maybe not, you know, them being at the right place. But to me, it's a question of where is this rub coming from? Is it an identity thing? I've had people say, I, I didn't sign up for this. That is not what I thought I was doing as a teacher. I don't think this is the right job for me. They didn't think, you know, it was their identity. Um, it's an interesting question though to, to ask. Maybe you need to enforce some things. Things haven't been done a certain way and you need to enforce them and they just need you to be more direct. Maybe you need to give them some permission. They just got there and they weren't able to do it in their last school, but they can do it here. Maybe there are other barriers. Maybe there's uh, some challenges medically, uh, mental health wise, family wise, that are just taking up their brain. Um, or maybe there's some social force or influence stuff. There was a guy that I worked with that said, I just don't even understand what's going on here. And I don't know why this person's not doing it in the army, which is where I came from. They would have just been doing it. And I'm like, this isn't the army. This is education. So he's like, I know, right? He's just walking around sort of in a daze, you know, uh, how, how might I see things uh, from the way that the other person's seeing them? Because I see it with my filters, right? So for me, it's not that you're their therapist, but I do want you to think to yourself, what do I want this person to, to change if I can request it or enforce it or expect it? And why, why might they not be doing it? Because the person might say to you, well, how are you going to help me with this? Or what are you going to do on your end? And I want to have, if I am, a partner in this or equally uh, involved or their supervisor or their mentor or their coach, I need to have some supports. What can I do to support this person to move forward? And my last question is, what do you need in order to have this conversation? And those questions, if asked before you get into the hard conversation, if asked before, it'll be a better hard conversation. In fact, you could say, oh, it's five o'clock, it's 510, I, I, I gotta go, I gotta go make dinner, I can't even be here for the script, which is the next page. But I'd, I'd say, great, bye, no problem. Because if you actually have this, you'll be in a better spot. The map is key, okay? So just a minute in the chat box. Given the outcome map format, and it's actually rows, it's not columns in the, in the packet that you've got, it's rows, so I apologize. Which rows do you think you're gonna need to put more attention in? Is there anything there that's surprising to you that you don't think about uh, enough? You know, which of those things do you not think about enough? And I'll actually put it up there. What, and just put in the all panelists and attendees. And then I'll show you the script. This is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Martin. Nobody, I have people that are exactly like what you're saying, Martin. I'd never thought about that. I'd never thought about what I was looking for. I just expected leaders to be able to do stuff. My words should just, they should just know, like miraculously. And I'm like, ah. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Lots of, lots of different spots. If you are their supervisor or their facilitator in a team or their mentor or their coach, 
or your role is to, as a curriculum, TOSA or whatever, the supports are really, are really a responsibility that you need to take, you have, you've got to take, um, take on. Yeah. Yep. Yes, perfect. It makes me think that if an expectation and a skill set don't match, we got to support and scaffold. Absolutely. And they're, they may, they may feel really awkward and embarrassed by that and a lot of other things. Yeah, absolutely. And is it an expectation? Is it a must? Is it a non-negotiable? Is it what's going on? Is this what's happening? Oh, if it's an up conversation, you sure as heck better have the problem done. If it's an up conversation and they say, well, what do you think I should do about it? You better have some suggestions. And then you could say, I would be happy to support this in this way. And here are my strategies for that too. An up conversation would be about suggestions and recommendations, not expectations. But doesn't mean that you go in, don't ever go into an administrator's office with a complaint with no solution. You got a map, got a map. I would say you're coming in with a concern or a request and you've got some possible ideas of things that would be helpful, but it all still would be mapped, okay? And if you need anything else, Christine, write me. My email's on there. Now, I know that you wanted to come to a Having Hard Conversation workshop to find out about the script. So I want to just share that. And that's what's going to happen right now. And it's on page 11. And so here we go. Um, this is a one pager and it's a scripting scaffold. And I should have actually just written the word scaffold there. The thing that I want us to think about with this is that it goes in order. The real key to this is that these parts, however you choose to end up filling them in, um, and I have samples and all that kind of stuff in here, it goes in order. And if we are missing one of these parts, it feels like it's missing. It, it, it just, I, and I'll, show, I'll tell you a sample when we're done. The first thing to me, I'll share the sample, is a setting the tone. A half a sentence, a sentence, uh, something that says this is going to start humanely. Um, it's a, a, sh a good show of wanting to, is, if, if we're going to be working together as we move into the school year, I, I, I want to share a few things that I think would be really useful. And, and I, I want you to know, I hope that we can really work productively together. It's showing a sense of goodwill. I did also have a friend who said to me, Jennifer, I love working with you. I really do, but what you said yesterday pissed me off. And I gotta share it with you, I gotta talk to you about it. But at least she told me she loved working with me. I spoke to Neil and I said, Neil, this is great in your class, this is great, and we gotta talk about something that's keeping you from being the best teacher that you can be. Notice that I then named the issue, but I didn't name, an and it's blah, 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 blah. I had to start with, I'm coming to this conversation willingly, uh, maybe vulnerably, but with an intent to share something that I think is going to be helpful as we move forward, okay? And, oop, and here's the issue. And the issue is what you have already, but you have no saliva, okay? No saliva. Whatever the main crux of this conversation is, you name it, no saliva. Now, what has the person done, not done, said, not said, to even get us into this conversation? What happened? I would suggest providing no more than three pieces of data. Um, if I was talking to the teacher that I was coaching, I might mention two or three things in that one class that I observed. If I mention more than three, I think he would feel kickboxed. At the beginning of a lesson, you did this, and then, then you stand it, and then five minutes later, you did this, and you did this, and you did this. It feels like you're pushing against somebody. So if you've been in a team with somebody and something's happened twice, share those two things, but don't go, and you've been like this since 2017, and I actually have things from that year too. I feel like current, specific, factual examples no more than three is enough. And that could be me being an English teacher. But to me, 
this happened, this happened, and this happened are pretty valid and sturdy pieces. If you go, oh, and then there was also this, and then there was also this, it feels like you're just adding, okay? So give some examples and then explain. Good, thank you, Amanda. Right, you were overwhelmed and shut down. Seven things is too much. If I give you a few examples and then I explain the impact that those, those behaviors had, we're threading the needle there. Um, you did this and this and the impact it had on students being able to understand um, that part of the lesson was diminished. Um, or when you said this and then this happened, it left the team, you know, on sort of unmoored and able to move forward. You have to thread the needle. You have to give the so what. You have to explain that in a way that somebody can hear it. And by that point, somebody's gonna be like, okay, okay, you're right, uh, I want out of this, or uh, I'm upset, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And if you have some specifics, share them. Or an overarching thing, and would, you know, and I've got a few things I wanna share, but they're all in the realm of blah, 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 blah. Would you like to, are you up for talking about that right now? And you finish. That sense of flow is what I want to talk about. And I'll do that in just a minute. But I also want to tell you that there are two other things that people might want to consider adding or not. People add their feelings to this conversation possibly too much. If it's interpersonal, if Trisha called me an idiot in this meeting, and I want to go to her and tell her I felt disrespected, that's fine because it's about us. But if Trisha didn't finish the budget, my feelings are really not the, the point of the conversation. Or if Jeff, I don't know, was, you know, not engaging all the girls in the math class, my feelings are not the issue. It's about the students. People add their feelings, their, their horror, their disgust, their dismay, their upsetness, their, their I can't believe it, or you should know better, and I'm just really incensed, to a lot of things that are not about you. It, it triangulates it. It makes it so the person then has to make you feel better and handle the issue. And so try to think about whether you want to add your feelings there. I did have one woman say, I don't know, I think a little shame and guilt being added to any hard conversation is a good thing. And I was like, maybe kind of not all the time, especially for an oppositional defiant person. Oh, really? You're disappointed that I didn't do it. Who cares is what that person's going to say. So I wouldn't make it about you. Decide if this is a hard conversation about you or about the issue. And then are you in any way responsible for this? Do you need to say, you know, I, you might be thinking I could have told you on, on Friday and I own the timing. That was on me. I should have. And we still need to get this move forward for Tuesday. Or you're probably wondering if I should have put this in writing to a bunch of us. And you know what? Totally understand that on me. I'll do that. I'm sharing it with everybody. And you, you know, a little personal invite to you. You gotta, you gotta do it. So those are possible additions, all right? Now, I wanna, I wanna go back just one time and share with you an example, okay? And then we're, I'm gonna get, get back into the chat box and then we've got 10 minutes. I'm gonna show you just a few other things and we'll finish up. Um, my father, before he passed, uh, was blind in one eye and driving. And my aunt called me, my brother called me, uh, his friend Bert called me, and when my brother called me, he said to me, you wrote the book, you talk to dad. <sighs> so I had to talk to dad. And I, not good to have to say something so uncomfortable, but I used my protocol. Dad, we really love you. And it's coming from that place. And we just want you to know that. Adam and I want you to know we love you. And we got to talk to you about your driving. Aunt Marilyn says that you're wobbling on the road. You mentioned that you can't see when the stove is on. 
but you can feel it. And that's really what helps you not burn yourself. And you can't see when the oven, you know, like the digital stuff in the oven, you told me you can't decide what the oven temperature is. And I'm beginning to worry that driving is going to hurt you or hurt somebody else. And I know that you don't want that and we don't want that. So Adam and I have talked about other ideas of how you can, you know, get around. And so we, we want to talk about next steps and I know it's not cool, but it's, it's what we got to do is, is, do you want to talk about it now or you want to take a few and just think about it. Now, his response to me in the moment was go to hell. Okay. You might get that. And I said to him, I get that this isn't fun. I didn't want to have the conversation and it's still really a necessary one to have. And we're going to talk about it. I need you to take a minute and think about it. And I'm going to get, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. I knew it was necessary trouble. You got to be able to talk about things that are uncomfortable. All right. To me, holding on to these things make a real, it, a big difference. Okay. So question to you, which part of those do you think you need to work through more? Just take a, just a 60 seconds and then I'll show you some stuff to finish up. But where do you see yourself going, oop, I need to really prep. And you're absolutely right, Amanda, do not. Bye, Diane. And you're right, no, no list of six or seven things. No list. Anybody? 58 people, I still see you. Naming the problem, thank you. Thank you, Trisha, for typing. It's, um, it's succinct, it's, um, it's also about something that they can, they can get a handle on. If you just say they're an ineffective colleague or they're a terrible teacher, not only is that saliva-y, but are they terrible in everything? And I've, I've talked to people because they blow it up and dramatize it. And it turns out that they're not terrible at planning and they're not terrible at instruction. They're terrible at classroom management. Well, that's way different, you know, so it's a huge thing. Okay. Naming the problem, clarifying the impact. Yeah. Okay. So when you're setting the tone, you feel disingenuous because you start out with a positive. Can you say, um, because I've had people say, I have nothing nice to say at all. I, I feel it's disingenuous. I don't say anything. Um, you could say, given that, da, 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 da. There are a few things I think we need to, to, to really look at. The, you're not saying anything loving, wonderful, positive, lying, BSing, any positive stuff from the, it's just given where we are now and where we're going, a few things need to be on the table. And it's just from this line forward. That's it. So that could be another way. But anyway, I've got, I've got a lot of ideas of starting stuff in the, in the book. But that's, that's the stuff that's really interesting, I mean, to me. In uh, the packet, just for you to know, you have some quick scripts. Let's say, oh my gosh, I'm never going to do this long stuff, but I'd like to practice with something shorter. Can you do what they do in crucial conversations, which is a state my path? you saw something that wasn't really cool and your brain, it went down and it had a path and there was a negative impact. And you just wanna share that action caused this effect. And I just want you to be aware, did you know that? I have, um, I was up in Seattle having, doing a conversation prior to this first, this election that had just happened here in the US. And uh, my, um, my, uh, my political affiliation prior to that election dropped out of my mouth. No, I just did say something. And a gentleman at uh, lunch said, can I talk to you? And he said, I noticed that you mentioned who you're voting for in the election. And I'm beginning to feel it wasn't necessary. And it kind of distracted me because I'm not voting for that person. And I just needed you to know. And I said, thank you so much. I totally appreciate it. I apologize. Totally not, not necessary, wasn't part of the conversation, and thank you for coming to me. And he goes, no problem. And I said, no, thank you for coming to me. He goes, okay. And I said, do you understand that most people wouldn't have actually, at, by lunch, have the courage or the maturity to come to the presenter and do that? 
they would have gone to their colleagues at lunch, they would have gone to the principal, and he goes, I don't understand that. I go, you don't need to be in the workshop anymore. You're done, you're great. But his response was so clear. He, he, he stated his path. It was distracting. It felt like he couldn't stay focused because now we're rubbed, you know, it was great. Second one, we're teaching this to kids, right? When you, I feel, you know, this is I messaging that we teach to children about what to do on the playground. I worry that we teach this, but we don't live it, okay? So I've had people say to me, when you rolled your eyes at the comment that I just made, the comment I made on Wednesday, I really felt disrespected, Jennifer. It was really hard for me to keep engaged because I was a little nervous because it was you and it'd be helpful to me if you just didn't do that. I mean, these are hard conversations and they're exactly what needs to happen and they take eight seconds. So that's just a thought, right? Now, if you say to me, Jennifer, I can't do six and I can't do three, how about one? Like, okay, so here's some one con line conversations. All of this is on page 13. And on page 13 is if you hear something that's emotionally damaging, racist, sexist, homophobic, Islamophobic, uh, about a community, uh, that kind of parent, those kinds of kids, that department, those, those students, that neighborhood, can you say something? You know, like, I, I think that's unfair, or that makes me uncomfortable, or I have a different opinion, or we don't, we don't, we respect all kids here. Whatever you can say, that's a hard conversation for many people. And so I just wanted you to know that these are some of the things that I call the seize the moments. And one, I always want to give cred to my friend, Letitia, my colleague who just retired, who said, I can't even do a sentence, but I will do one word. I promise you that if something is hurtful and I can't do anything else, I'll say, ouch. So she's just... We now, when we were in a, a group together, we would have just the ouch. And if people couldn't do anything else, but that just was an ouch. Now I have a friend who's like, I have an ouch, I have an ouch. We're not, that's like now code, right? For, okay, let's slow down what happened there, okay? So there are so many ways to, to do this, right? Now we're finishing up and we're not gonna do that one, but I am gonna finish up by showing you two things. And please wait one whole minute for me. First up, body language, palms down during a hard conversation. Do not keep your palms up, it looks wimpy, okay? Looks like you're beggy, okay? So during a hard conversation, they're not out, at least they're down. Put your palms on your, on your, um, on your legs, put your palms down. It, it makes a more credible stance. Preparing yourself emotionally is where I'm gonna end. And I'm gonna tell you, and you're gonna think I'm nuts. And so Trisha, please hang out with me. And Jeff, please hang out with me. When you are too emotional, when you're too stressed, when you feel like it's too scary and you're shaking, I need you to stay in your body and to stay grounded. And I tell everybody this. I need you to do what my colleague um, and actor colleague, uh, Eric Booth taught me. Eric taught me that in those moments, instead of biting your lip and instead of getting shaky and instead of clenching your fists and getting really all nervous, you've got to ground yourself. So I'm gonna tell you something at the very end. You may not tweet this, but you have to just remember this. I need you to sphincter up. I know you're gonna say, she waited till the very end to say that. I need you to squeeze inside. Everybody's gonna try it right now. I'm sure you're totally horrified, but when you do that, where's your focus? Your focus is below your waist. Are you worrying about shaking? Are you worried about getting really nervous? Are you worried about clenching? No, because you're clenching. I want you to sphincter up, squeeze. Your focus will ground yourself. You won't weep, you'll stay strong. And that's what I want you to do because you gotta get into necessary trouble. If you need anything, this is my last slide. Any last comments, Trisha, Jeff, Thank you. And this is our code from now on. Yeah. Okay, that's our code. Just don't tweet it because it's just too weird. <laughs> I love that. That was a great way to end. Jennifer, thank you so much. 
Uh, Tricia, anything from you? Anything you saw in the chat? Um, Thank you for the extra minute. I appreciate it. Just, you know, again, I, I, you know, the thing that struck me is how common this is amongst practitioners in our field. And Jennifer, thank you so much for, for your time. And I, I think, you know, the, the resources in the packet, this would make for such a brilliant, just ask somebody that you work with, can we like have a coffee chat with some of yeah. these and practice through them? Like, I really appreciate that you gave us um, oh. frames that we can rehearse because I, I think that helps. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Especially Trisha, who is like the frame queen around here. Like she yeah. just, woman makes, say she makes frames for everything. So I'm sure she's, but no, thank you so much for the packet and for all the ideas. And I think one of the things, you know, that as you were talking through this and I, it came up in the chat a couple of times too. And I even had a couple of teachers who emailed me before this saying, you know, we, how do you have those hard conversations with parents? And I think a lot of these same, you know, the same frames work with parents as well of how do you get parents to be on your side, yes. right? Like, and I have that, I have a whole 90 minute on that too, Jen. <laughs> I'm sure you do, I do. right? And I think that's just, it's, it's a good thing to do. And I love the idea of teaching this to kids. Yes. You know, where as a high school teacher, if you're an ELA high school teacher or social studies high school teacher, great place to set this into your curriculum. You know, where do we? There, do we we're doing it with uh, the English Schools Foundation in Hong Kong. I have a assistant principal who's who's working with me, and we've got a team, and they're gonna they're gonna work on it. It's Ange Malone. Maloney. It's it's Trisha's mm. friend Ange. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jennifer's Thanks. contacts are there on the screen, and we'll make sure that they are uh, everywhere that this ends up being uh, put out as well, so you can reach out to her. Uh, uh -oh. Thanks again for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And I feel like I need you to give me like a digital signature on my copy oh, of your book. Like you, if you it, sign girl. it. There we go. Great. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Talk to you all later. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Take care.